Hi everyone and welcome to this um, special virtual event on International Women's Day 2021. My name is Heather Doran and I'm the Public Engagement Manager from the award-winning Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science at the University of Dundee and we are hosting this event this evening um, via Zoom and we should also be streaming on Facebook and via our YouTube channel as well. So just a little bit about this event and how it's going to run. So we are live streaming it. You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter and on LinkedIn. We are at LRCFS if you would like to um, send us a message or share anything while we are online. I hope everyone has got their cake ready and um, because we've got a very busy hour of discussion ahead with some of the writers, actors and scientists who are behind the TV show Races. If you are watching this event via Zoom, you can ask a question via the Q&A function and that will come to the panel. So please do get involved with that. I'm afraid we can't take questions through the other services. And just to let everyone know this event is being recorded, although we can't see any of you attendees, you can just see us. Um, and so people can watch the event later as well. Now I'm going to introduce all the panellists that we have this evening. So we're going to do a very quick introduction because if we did a, all everyone involved has got lots of accolades and lots of things that they've done. So this is going to be a quick introduction to some of the things that they have done. Um, and first up we have Val McDermott, who is a celebrated best-selling Scottish crime writer. She's the originator of the idea for Traces and she's worked with the team here at the University of Dundee for many years, including on the MOOC, which was real. We'll speak more about that later, I think. We have Professor Neve McDade, who is the director of the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science. She's an authorised forensic chemist with expertise, which includes fire scene investigation and the manufacture of drugs. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and a champion for public engagement and the communication of science. We have Professor Lucina Hackman, who is a chartered forensic anthropologist who conducts research at the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science and works as a forensic anthropologist in Scotland and the UK. We have Amelia Bulwar, who is an actor and writer known for roles in I'm Alan Partridge, Ashes to Ashes and 2012. She is a writer for Tracy's Series 1 and is working on Tracy's Series 2 with writer Jess Williams. We have Laura Fraser, who is a Scottish actress who had roles in TV programmes such as Breaking Bad and Lip Service. And you might recognise her as Professor Sarah Gordon, who is Professor of Forensic Chemistry in Traces. And we have Jennifer Spence, who is a Canadian actress who has had roles in many films and TV series, including You, Me, Her, Travellers and Continuum. And she plays Professor Cathy Torrance, who is Professor of Forensic Anthropology in races. So that is our panel this evening and to start us off we're going to go right back to the beginning and we're going to go straight to Val. So Val can you tell us more about where the original idea for traces came from? Well as you said I've been working with the people in Dundee for a very long time. Uh, I first met Sue Black back in the early 1990s uh, and she became my, my source for all things forensic. Anything Sue didn't know she'd pass me like a parcel to someone who did know. And so over the years, that relationship built up. We worked together on the Million for a Morgue. And then Sue and Neve decided that it would be a really good idea to do a MOOC, uh, one of these online courses that anyone from anywhere can join in on. And they wanted essentially me to write a sort of backstory for the MOOC that they could then apply different aspects of forensic science to. So I wrote a, a little outline and, and then they all came in with their amazing specialisms. I learned lots of things I didn't already know. We put that together and it went out and, and thousands and thousands of people all around the world took part in it. And when we were talking about it afterwards, uh, I remembered how often I'd heard forensic scientists say to me, it's so infuriating when you see programmes like CSI or Silent Witness, where one person does all the forensic science and does it in five minutes. And it's so frustrating because it's not like that. And I knew from my own experience with, with these people that there's more than enough wow moments in the reality. You don't need to mess about making stuff up. Uh, and so I, I came up with the idea of uh, seeing if we could maybe make a drama that showed forensic science as it actually is. Um, and so that's where it started from. I, I put together a very 
loose outline and I took it to Red Productions and they got on board and here we are now. Fantastic. So Amelia, can you tell us how the idea developed into the TV show? So the next stage from the original submission. Well, Val in her wisdom said she didn't want to write it. Having had this uh, huge ambitious idea, she said, I think it'd be excellent if somebody else, um, you know, took this on. I mean, to be fair, Val writes books and she said, I like writing books, that's what I do. Um, get somebody who writes television. Red, who I'd worked for a lot over the years, got in touch with me and I saw Val's document and uh, I said, look, this is absolutely fascinating. I don't know anything about the background of this work, of this science. I don't know how I would set about it. I don't know these people, unlike you, you do know these people. So I went off to Dundee and I met Meath and I met Sue and I looked around um, their workplace and I met lots of people and got a feel for it. I'd never been to Dundee before, even though I know Scotland quite well because my husband's Scottish. And I came back to Red uh, with my attache case and said, it's great, you know, it's gonna be great. Um, the science is great, the people are great, the place is great. Um, it's tricky because you're not coming at a crime through the normal window, which is police. You're coming, so in a way you have to encourage, teach an audience to be interested in a slightly different angle and a slightly different pace of discovery and of, you're not gonna see uh, the victim. You're not gonna get involved in interviews in the same way. And so we took it from there. It didn't get greenlit by the channel we took it to. And in the end, it got greenlit by Alibi, which is a crime channel. And that meant we had to look at it again to make sure that it did have that procedural element. But all the way through, it has been dozens upon dozens and dozens of conversations, consultations, going back uh, until it's good enough. Thank you. So, Neve, can you tell us a little bit how you were involved in making the forensic science come to life on screen while also making sure that it was portrayed as free to life? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, I think Amelia is doing herself a bit of a disservice um, in that she's talking about it. She worked really hard to understand with us, the scientists, um, just what what we were also trying to achieve and, and one of the things that was really important for us when we first um, spoke to, to Val about the, the, the bit of a mad idea to, to, to see if we could pull together a crime series, it was to hold true to something that Val has, has always held true with us and that is that when we work with her, um, uh, when she asks us um, for any material for her books is that she works incredibly hard to get the science right. And so we wanted, if we were going to go down the road of a TV series, we wanted to ensure that the science was part of the character, that it was the science that was going to be true to form. It wasn't going to be um, uh, misrepresented in any way as much as was possible for us to do. So that first journey or one of the journeys that Amelia made to Dundee happened to coincide with a workshop we were running, if you remember. Um, and that workshop happened to be a group of my dear friends and colleagues from the European Fire Investigation Working Group. And we happened to be running a workshop um, during the, the, the working group meeting, which involved setting fire to a toaster, if I recall. And so we had Amelia in our lab watching how we, we um, were able to manipulate and override some of the safety devices in the toaster and then set it on fire, funnily enough, with pieces of cardboard sticking out of it. So I think we had the idea sold early on from there. I think there was much cake and much tea during that visit as well. And I think in part, it wasn't just about the nature of the science or the, the, the crime writing story that we wanted to, to, um, to speak about and to show the character of, but it was also the people and it was the, the trust that we had in each other and the way in which we looked after each other when we deal with, um, with casework. So it's, it's broader and richer in terms of that story. But for me, a critical element of getting involved in this was to, to have trust in the writers um, in the concept that they would be true to us and true to the science we were going to present to them. And, and I have to say, 
they were very patient with us. Uh, Amelia in particular was very patient with us as we kept saying, no, 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 we want this bit to look like this. And um, so it was an awful lot of backwards and forwards in terms of, of, of the conversation. But I think equally, um, um, we, you know, we were, we were tested in our explanation of things to ensure that what we were explaining was was translating into something that was accessible by members of the public and that was a really i think a strong relationship that we have we had around that including last story if i remember um a meeting in a hotel room amelia that we had when i was in london and uh, we were both in london at the same time where i bought a, 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 a toaster and then we took it apart in the hotel bedroom so i could show you all the bits of it and then took it back downstairs to the to the guy in the reception, asked him for a scissors, cut the plug off, gave him back the plug, the scissors and the toaster and asked him to put it in the bin. I thought he thought I was a nutter, but you know, that's nothing unusual. <laughs> it's going over to uh, you, Laura, and then I'm going to give the same question to you as well, Jen. You obviously present on screen, you portray um, the, um, the forensic science group in in traces was there anything that you found that was really tricky to, to get right on screen when you were either talking about the forensic science or portraying it um yeah <laughs> everything like i mean i i really 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 did honestly try to grasp what i was saying but i i only understood uh, a thousand of even the lines that I was saying, I, I wanted to, I thought, I imagined that I maybe would actually, maybe even half understand the processes, but I mean, I, I, I really, I really didn't. I, 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 I'm just, I would need to, to go to uni and get a couple of degrees and I just, uh, I wish, but I'm interested. That's why I wanted to do the show because I wanted to learn and I, I felt, I sort of felt like, I learned a bit, but actually in learning what I learned, I realized how much more I don't know. And um, I know there's tons more I don't know that I don't know. You know, I just, I feel absolutely, I always have my, my doubt about my acting anyway, and now I have all these extra doubts, but it makes it interesting. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. And Jen, for you, is there anything that you, you found particularly tricky? Yeah, I mean, it definitely like Laura, it's just making sure that that, uh, you know, half understand, if not fully understand what's going on. Um, but yeah, it was wonderful. We were able to ask questions of Amelia and anyone else. Uh, we had a wonderful uh, consultant as well named Ali who helped us a lot um, on set as well. And, and we went to um, the university, I feel so awful. It's the University of Lancashire, right? Not University of Lancaster. Okay, I was like, I gotta get that right. <laughs> um, university of Lancashire, we had a, a field trip, which was fun just before we started shooting the first season. And we went and um, so got to, to see, you know, hold bones and, and see these makeshift burnt out rooms and learn all these things. And so I remember asking Ali at the time, can you show me how you scrounge through, you know, ruins essentially, right? Because I want to make sure that I've got the hand, you know, moves right and stuff. So it was like, just try not to look like an idiot. Try not to bring pain <laughs> to the profession was my sort of... <laughs> Well, everyone has joined us on the call today. So I think that confirms that everyone is still is very happy with how things how things went. Um, so Val, back to you now. We've talked a little bit, a bit about the setting of Dundee. Why was it, why was the setting of Dundee chosen? It, was that important as part of, of coming together with Traces? It was important for me because um, I, we already had, I already had a connection with the department at Dundee. I knew the people there. I knew that uh, because of the support I've had over the years um, with my attempts to be accurate and authentic in what I'm writing, I knew that if we got that, the, the, the Leverhulme people on board, we would be absolutely rock solid in terms of getting the information and the cooperation and the communication skills that I'd learned to exploit over the years. Um, but also, uh, setting something in Scotland, I wanted very much to get away from the, the Glasgow-Edinburgh axis. Um, it seemed to me that everything set in, in Scotland in drama was either Glasgow or Edinburgh or somewhere pretty. 
uh, like the Northwest Highlands or Shetland. Uh, and I thought it would be really good to, to go to a city that hadn't been exploited on, on television to show people a different aspect. And really it was, it was a no brainer because we had, had Dundee with all the changes that have been along the waterfront to make it as glamorous as it, as it now looks as you come across the Tay Bridge. And then you've got the law in the middle of it, which is sitting there behind you, Heather. Uh, and that, of course, has, has these fabulous views across the, the fourth to, to across the Tay to, to Fife. And so it seemed to me that there was lots of potential there for, for good visuals, as well as it for, be, for being the, the easy access to really good labs and good science. Uh, I've... My career has been kind of in tandem with the development of modern forensic science. My first book was published in 1987. The first time DNA was used in, in the courtroom was 1986. So I kind of feel that I've, I've, I've walked in lockstep all these years and it's been such an exciting process. And I knew we could convey some of that excitement if, we, if we'd set it here and we, we worked with the people who over the years have been so vital in, in me getting it right in my books. Thanks, Val. So yes, behind me, you can see the, the Dundee law behind me. And we're going to go over to Lucina now, who, who has the Tay Bridge behind her on her background. So Lucina, can you tell us a little bit about how uh, the forensic anthropology as portrayed in series one reflects on what life is like as a forensic anthropologist in Scotland? Well, thanks, Heather. Um, yes, so I think it's fairly um, accurate. Like many forensic anthropologists, it combines um, academia with um, forensic anthropology casework, which is um, the reality for a lot of us and certainly for myself. Um, we work um, as academics, we teach, we do research um, and then we uh, get called out um, and go out when we get called, basically. Uh, we don't know what cases we might be involved in or where in Scotland we might work and we do end up in some prettier places in fact Dundee itself is pretty as well now as, as uh, Val quite rightly says um, don't know what time of year we're going to get called out or what day we're going to get called out and that's that's the reality of working as a forensic anthropologist um, meanwhile uh, when we're not out on cases um, we're doing teaching teaching the next generation of forensic anthropologists which is a uh, um, really important um, thing to be able to do um, and we also undertake research and a lot of the work that we do when we go out to cases informs our research so the two are tied in really closely so that when, when somebody like Val comes to us and asks us questions we're able to, to um, help her out and answer those questions so which is a real privilege to be able to do that. Thanks Lucina. So I'm going to ask this question first to um, Amelia, but I'm going to invite everyone to respond to it. Do you think that you achieved what you wanted to achieve on screen? And is there anything you might do differently next time? Now we know there is a series two. So someone on the Q&A has already asked for a spoiler for the next series, um, but we're probably not going to be able to reveal anything there, but that's a question for, for you, Amelia. Um... It's funny, the things that we have uh, changed or set about differently are more processes than anything else. The great thing about the first series um, going down well is that people, particularly the people, because it's a big machine to make a television show. And um, initially people have concerns, you know, there were concerns, would the science carry? Yes, it does. Would people get it? Would people be interested in it? Yes, they are. Uh, and then, so that there are things that we have adjusted this time around, like better communication, trying to get earlier communication with Neve and Lucina about the science being done, not just the science, but the props, the set, all the things, because so many people are involved in the making of a program. It's one thing for me or Jess to talk to Lucina or Neve, but then that, bit of script or that concept goes to so many different departments. It's fractal. It goes on and on and on. And you may think you've written it cast iron in a script in such a way that it can only be interpreted one way, but it just goes on and on and on the surprising and complex nature of people's interpretation. So you have to really look after that. And then the other thing is, um, 
uh, I would say the way we shoot it this time round, uh, I think we were so concerned to get the science looking really um, sciencey, which of course it must. But this time I think we're going to be a bit more dynamic with how we shoot, say, in the laboratory or say in the mortuary. That's not to say it's not lit with the right kind of light. You've got to be able to see what you're doing. That's essential. But a bit more handheld, a bit more um, really getting in with the curiosity of the camera rather than thinking you have to lay it out in a slightly more formal, cool, because science way. So I think we're going to dare to keep the science as accurate as we can possibly achieve it whilst letting the camera be a little, bo little bit more intimately engaged with what's being done, things like that. But for the most part, we're pleased to, dis to discover that what we hoped would work seems to have gone down okay. Thank you. Does anyone else want to respond to that about achieving what we want to achieve on screen? Yes, go for it, Make a few comments. I think that the, um, for me, it was the first time working on a on a on a series like this, and I got the opportunity to go on set, which was which was really really interesting, and to see the world from the the perspective of the the writers and and the actors and and all of the the people that were involved in the production, and so um, and just watching how the scenes were put together and how many people there are standing around when the actors are doing their bit and 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 um, uh, performing uh, how many people are in the wings was a real surprise because I just didn't didn't I think thought they would clear the set and you know like they do in the movies of the movies if you know what I mean um so that was really interesting and it, it was it was really interesting as well just to see how challenging it was and how hard it is to get it right and to get the right um intonation to get the right um angles and look and feel to the whole to the whole piece it was really quite eye-opening so, so there was that. So it was really interesting, really, really interesting um, and illuminating from that perspective. Did, did I think we got things right? I think we, did, we didn't do too badly. Um, I was really pleased at the way in which um, uh, some of the aspects of the laboratory were portrayed and um, the way in which the, the fire scene was done was really good. Um, and the, 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 the prop makers um, really got it nailed down the way that we were we, we had kind of uh, thought about it and, and talked to them and talked to Amelia as well about um, just getting the patterns right. And that was, they did a pretty good job. So that was pretty good. Uh, and I got to keep the toaster. So, you know, there you go. I have the burnt out toaster from Traces downstairs in, in, in our office. So there you are. So what would we do next time? I think you're right, um, Amelia. I think we're, we're paying a little bit more attention to the, to the, the, the tightness of some of the detail. Um, and, and I very much appreciate the back and forth. I know we talk a lot um, with yourself and with Jess about um, getting the, the, the fine detail right. And we're, we're working a little bit more with the prop makers this time around as well. So that, that is, I guess, what's, what's different this time than the last. Does anyone else want to comment on um, what we achieved this time and what you might do differently next time? Yeah, over to you, Val. Yeah, um, one of the things I wanted to say, particularly since it's International Women's Day, is that uh, throughout my involvement with forensic science, I've, I've worked with a lot of women doing really important jobs, doing them very well. And I think women are very uh, extensively represented in forensic science. And so when I came to, to talk to the, Amelia about this, I thought it was important, really important, that we had female leads in the show. Uh, and I think Laura and Jen have done a fantastic job of conveying the nature of the job. But not just that, what makes drama work is the same thing that makes what makes a book work. You have to be invested in the characters. It, if you don't care about the people at the heart of the drama, it doesn't matter how good the science is because people will not come back and watch it again. And we didn't just have female leads on this. It was a, a female-led production right from the top down, exec producer, producer, directors, writers, cast, advisors. And I think that's made a real difference to the, to the atmosphere, to the feel of working together on this. And certainly um, Martin Compton said to me afterwards, he said, he said, that's the friendliest set I've ever worked on. And I think it was true. There was a different feel being on, on the set of Traces to, to being on, on other productions that I've worked with. And I think that uh, that's in, in no, due in no small measure 
to the way that, that women really played an important part in putting this all together. Thanks, Val. Anyone else? Yeah, go for it, Jen. I'll just quickly jump in because, yeah, I just wanted to echo what, what Val said. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those things that where I've sort of felt like it shouldn't be a big deal, right? Having a, a female led production, female leads, female scientists, like it shouldn't be a big deal. It shouldn't be abnormal, but it is a big deal, you know? And so just that, uh, that we could do that. Um, I'm going to be North American and just say, I'm really proud of, of what we all accomplished together. <laughs> and, you know, I just think it was just so wonderful. Like just, uh, you know, I was hooked the minute I read the scripts, you know, so Val and, and Amelia just, uh, they really hooked me and, and just felt like I knew who the characters were, all of them. And then seeing the cast rounded out and the help of Neve and Sue and now Lucina, it's just like, I feel like uh, I feel like we're a solid team. <laughs> That's great. Um, so we've spoke a little bit about some of the the science coming on screen. So one of the questions that we've got in is quite um, specific about what it's asking, but I think it might um, help us talk a little bit more about how some of those conversations might have happened. So the question is. Who came up with the explanation of the GCMS and did the complex scientific concepts have a number of explanations? How did you come about that? So that was a key moment when Emma explains it to Daniel's dad and she explains what's going on. So that, I thought that was an excellent scientific explanation and really just worked really well. But how did you come to that within the script? What, yes, Amelia? Neve expl explained the GCMS machine to me with treacle and balls and pipes. And I'm no fool. I thought, well, look, that's going in. <laughs> and then the question was, with all these explanations, is you've got to have the right person explain something to the right person. When you've got two experts, they don't need to do that. We've all seen it on telly, drives everybody mad, where somebody who wouldn't need to spell something out to somebody does so for reasons of plot, and exposition expediency. And we all know it stinks. So the trick, if you possibly can, is to have someone who doesn't know, might be a novice, might be complete outsider, might be somebody equally expert, but just in a different field. And then if you possibly can to get exposition to do two things. So in that scene, it's Daniel meeting, Dan uh, Emma meeting Daniel's dad for the first time out in an Indian restaurant, everybody's dressed up, and he, for actually very suspect reasons, is trying to find out who the hell she is, what she's doing in Dundee. And she begins to talk about her work. And Daniel, because he's smitten and he's proud of her, is trying to get her to show off about the GCMS, which Daniel has listened to and knows is called, what's it called? Bobby. So then Emma, by way of telling her boyfriend's dad what she does, tells us something we really need to know, which is how does a GCMS machine work? And they all get the giggles because it's sort of, there's a bit of innuendo about the treacle and the pipe and the balls and all the rest of it, very obvious stuff. But it, it was pleasing because it did a few things in one go. And you didn't think you were getting a lesson about a GCMS. You thought you were watching three people riff over dinner. Yeah, Valerie, you got a comment? Yeah, I just I just wanted to say that I I felt no unease about the ability of uh, us to communicate to the viewers the nature of the elements of the forensic sciences that we were going to be exploring. Because over the years that I've had a, a lot of time spent with forensic scientists, one of the things I have noticed is what good communicators they are. And they're very good at explaining complex things in terms that a lay person totally understands. And as, as Neve did with the balls and the pipes, they're very good at, at creating images in your head where you can see it for yourself and, that, and you can relate that to what you're being told about. I can remember once uh, asking Sue Black what a body would look like if it had been in a peat bog for 200 years. And there was a brief pause. And then she said, a leather bag with a face on. 
And that phrase went straight into the book. And it's there in the book, a leather bag with a face on. And you know, what more can you ask for people than that? So after years of, of having explanations like this given to me, uh, I was I was in no I had no worries on this score whatsoever. Thank you. Yeah, back to Amelia. Just want to say, like Lucina was saying, they teach, these women teach. That's among the things they do. So you've got a gift, which is a legitimate place for somebody to communicate information. And there were, were, there were misgivings about those scenes. Sarah has a small lecture about how fire happens. And um, Kathy has a, a short, very short lesson about cutting bone. And people, there were misgivings about, would it be dry to have those, those bits? It is not dry. Somebody telling you something interesting and telling it well is good. And people really enjoyed them. So we've got more courage this time round to say, it's not dry, it's not boring people are into it and it's what our women do really well. So let's go for it. Neve, do you want to come in? Um, and, and another one, you're very kind, um, Amelia, and the story of how do, you, how do you communicate what a GCMS is came from actual, a real conversation with a real, I think it was a lawyer who was asking me, what, what did this thing called a GCMS do? And that's the story I came up with. But I think it was also, um, um, I think the context that you put it into made the, the, the teaching um, of that technique fit in with the story in a different way, the story of, of the characters in a different way, where, as you said, it's almost by osmosis that people realise that they're suddenly getting it and they're suddenly understanding it. Um, I think on, on part of the, the Twitter feed that, that, that was following the programme, um, I was certainly reading some, some of the tweets relating to it where people felt that the, the, the GCMS and the chemistry was being explained properly, that for, for once it was part of the story and not just this thing in the corner that made beeping noises and produced um, results. And I thought, um, Laura, if you ever want a job as a lecturer, I thought you did really well in that lecture portrayal. One of my previous students um, said to me after she saw that, she said, um, she said, oh, I knew who was talking there um, because you just got it right. So you did very well. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you all for commenting on, on, on that. So we've got a question, another question in um, from someone online. So Amy Cameron has asked, um, she said she wants to say that um, Molly Windsor, who she's not here, was outstanding in her role as well, which I think we can all agree on. And her question was, was it a conscious decision to show the diversity of people working in science as part of the show? Does anyone want to comment on that? I think just yes, you know, universities learning, they're vibrant international places. Dundee is a centre of excellence. The university, our fictional version of Tayside University and our fictional CIFA, we're saying this is a centre of excellence. People are coming from all over the world here. At the time, I think four of the country's top eight forensic scientists were working out of CAHID, the Centre for Anatomy and Human Identification. I don't know if that stands, but and it, it was an incredible concentration of amazing brains. And that means you've got international teachers and you've got international students and it gives it a real zest, I think, and is accurate. So uh, you'd be mad not to want to portray it. Does anyone else want to offer a comment on, on that? Okay, so we've had a few questions about the MOOC, both before the event and during the event now. So I think we should chat a little bit more about that. One of the questions that we did get in um, before the event um, started was a question from someone who asked, was the plot for Tracy's developed parallel to the conception of, of the MOOC? Or was it fleshed out into the plot that became the TV series after? So maybe if we can chat just a little bit about what the MOOC was and how they both kind of linked together um, and how the MOOC ended up on Traces as well. I don't know who would like to answer that one. Oh, Val and Neve are both going. Val, do you want to go first? Or Come on, Neve, you go first. You've unmuted. Um. Okay, I mean, I, the, the MOOC was primarily focused around um, 
forensic anthropology and it was called identifying the dead so I was actually going to nominate the wonderful Professor Hackman to answer that question because she was one of the stars of it. Hi, uh, the MOOC. Um, yes, the MOOC was developed, uh, came out of a series of conversations as, as do many of these things as you'll have gathered by now, it was quite organic, um, but it was about capturing people's imagination um, and doing it, we did it in such a way that it was done as if it was a live event. So we had a newscaster coming on and saying that um, uh, body had been found and, and taking the, the, the per people working through the MOOC through to the next week. So they actually were learning, um, understanding what had been done on each week. Um, I only did one week for the MOOC. I did uh, part of it. So my part was about the forensic anthropology as which won't be a surprise to anyone um, and looked at um, understanding how you, um, uh, what information you can get when somebody has been dismembered um, and the sort of damage that can happen to bone and what sort of um, intelligence you can get um, from that. So that was my part, but I also had colleagues that did the facial reconstruction uh, weeks. So we had colleagues that did looking at the biological profile, how you would identify somebody from the, um, what sort of uh, sex they were when they were alive, what age they were when they died, all that sort of information that goes towards identification. And then that's um, added into the facial reconstruction. I had colleagues that looked at how you would recover um, buried remains as well. So it, it formed a pattern and was uh, developed as if it had been um, a uh, situation, a case that you're working on from the moment of the discovery of a bone through to identification of um, the victim themselves. So it was very, um, it was very creative like that, but it also each week built on the week before um, as we went through. And it was based, as we know, on a story. So Val got, um, it, uh, provided us with a story that we then built on. So I'll probably now bounce that to Val so she can um, explain how that story came about. Over to you, Val. Well, it started as it usually does in, this, in your department with cake. Um, <laughs> and we were talking about uh, a MOOC. I'd never, I'd never heard of a MOOC before. I didn't know what a MOOC was. Uh, and then Sue and uh, Sue Black and, and Neve collared me and, and one of our conversations and said, we want to do a MOOC. Uh, and here's the kind of thing we want to do. These are the elements of the science that we want to showcase. So they gave me some bare bones ideas of things that they wanted to, to be able to, to do in the course of, of this MOOC. Uh, and I went away and, and, and essentially came up with the storyline. Um, and we, 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 yeah, we exchanged various uh, views and, and, and suggestions over the, the build up into the MOOC. And some of the things I asked for uh, were forthcoming and fed into my story. And at the end, when, when students had completed the MOOC, they got, uh, they got sent a copy of the, the short story of the backstory, if you like, that had led to this, this body on the law. So when it came to proposing a, an idea for a television series, uh, I have to say I'm fundamentally lazy. I don't like anything to go to waste. So the fact that I'd uh, taken part in, in putting this MOOC together, uh, I thought that was a good vehicle as a jumping off point for a television series. The, the original MOOC uh, and the TV series start to diverge quite widely, quite quickly. Um, but the, the, the essential idea of this being a good way in, a good way to start the story, and also a good way to start showing some basic principles of what we were going to be covering in the science over the coming weeks. I thought that was a, was a decent place to start. Uh, and, and I also thought that with all the people that had uh, uh, taken part in, in doing the course on the MOOC, they'd get a lot of word of mouth around the series that had a MOOC in it. Uh, so waste nothing, that's my motto. Thanks for um, sharing that, Val. Does anyone else want to comment on the MOOC? Are we all, all good? So we've had an important question in from the audience, which was um, obviously cake is mentioned quite a lot in the TV show, but um, someone wants to know, was the cake on set any good? Was the cake on set and was it good cake? Yes, Laura, you're jumping in straight away. I'm very passionate about this one. Um, it was so good. Like there was different ones each time. And when it was flat, flat the flapjacks, I don't know. Who, yeah. It was, I remember it was Kate and it was a friend of hers. Oh my God. And I think I ate about 13 flapjacks that day and then had lunch. 
um, and all of the cakes sublime and that's all I have to say about that <laughs> well that's that's good to know to uh, mention that I must say in the in the um, tv oh Amelia wants to mention something about the cake as well what do you mean? there was something fantastic that happened that wasn't scripted which was there's a scene between Sarah and Kathy in the kitchen area and Sarah is nursing a Tupperware container with flapjacks in them and she's talking and riffing and eating these flapjacks and at the end of it Kathy says which wasn't scripted are you going to share those and it was just great because I didn't see it till I saw the rushes of that week and uh, I thought well look that's just great it, it happened it was so alive and uh, I just thought they might this must I just thought people are getting on this is cooking and working if people are playful and having a good time and making a joke in character which is a better ending to the scene than was written so that was a good moment Neve, is there a, oh, sorry, yeah, go on, Val. Very, very quickly, I think it always helps uh, a, a series, whether it's a series of books or a television series, if there is a particular trope that, that is to do with the relationship between the characters that you build on as the series goes forward. And it's always there, and people are almost starting, they're almost waiting for the cake. They're waiting for the next thing. And it, it, it makes people feel invested in what you're doing if they've got that sort of, they feel part of the, the whole process. So uh, it started off, I suppose, as a little bit of a joke and, and, as, and became quite an important part of, of what we were doing. Neve, do you want to say anything about the cake? Because the cake is present at, at LRCFS, although I must say, in, in the difference to the TV show, I don't think I've ever tasted cake that anyone has actually made from um, any members of uh, staff at LRCFS. And it's mostly people who have brought it in. You, you, so, so... The cake is very much present um, uh, in, in the University of Dundee, actually. We do a lot of, of conversations around cake. Um, and it just depends um, at the, the right time of year and whether or not there's a particular event on. But we have got some very good cake bakers within the center um, that, that will occasionally, mainly the students, I have to say, um, that will, uh, at, at, when we have our when we used to have our Christmas gathering, we have a, a, a tradition where everybody brings some sort of food to, to uh, um, uh, so that we can all have a meal together. And quite a few of the students and members of staff bring all sorts of goodies and cakes and all sorts of nice um, things that they're able to produce for us. And it is, it's such a wonderful, um, I suppose, homely thing to do um, that it really does, um, make a difference, I think, uh, particularly if you're having a meeting that's, you know, sometimes might be challenging is to have a cup of tea or coffee and a nice piece of cake. And it always seems to ease the tensions. So those things are really important. Over to you, Val. I wonder actually if this might be something that's vaguely crime related, um, because certainly amongst the Scottish uh, book festivals, there's a certain level of competitiveness about the, the baking of the, the committees and the supporters. And there's an ongoing rivalry in particular between the Ullapool Book Festival and the Cove and Kilcreggan Book Festival. And it's very hard for us writers because you have to be diplomatic here. And you have to, I've ended up taking the view that uh, one of them has the best tray bakes and the other one has the best scones. Thanks everyone um, for answering on that question. So we've got another question that's come in, which now that it's been shown that science can be positively received by viewers, if it's integrated effectively in the plot and communicated well, do you think the use of more accurate science will spread through more TV crime shows? Um, I, I would, I, I saw Lucina shaking her head there, so um, um, I, I think it's, I would like to think so, because I think that it's, it's very, very important to, to, to me and to the, to the way in which we portray science within the courtrooms that, um, of course, the, the, that the expectation of the people who ultimately are the receivers of that science in, in, in the serious matters relating to the court, um, understand it well and don't have preconceived ideas that they might have derived from television programs or whatever. So it's an important thing to try to do is to try to portray science as accurately as we can. 
I think the, 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 the TV series has shown that the science itself can be really interesting and it can be part of the, the interest and capture the imagina imagination of the public. I think that's been shown. Um, but the TV programmes are entertainment, so it's, it's, and that's their job. So it's about getting the message through those sets of TV programmes such that you don't, you maintain the detail of the science and the accuracy of it and keep it true to itself, but you also don't lose the story. So I think there's a trade-off. And I think that the, um, the, I think we've got it right within, within Traces, how we work so closely with, with the writers, um, that that trade-off worked. Um, but I think that you, you can't do it for everything. And I think that we picked the right subjects and the right topics um, to, to portray the science as, as accurately as we were able to do. So I, I, I would like to hope yes, but I think that TV is TV and it's about drama and it's about the other aspects of what tells a story. Um, and so it's, it's going to end up being a balance. What it is, is very hard work. There's an awful lot of hard work by the writers in particular and by the prop makers to try to follow what, what we ask them to do as closely as, as they can. And they did, did an excellent, excellent job. But I think that there is that trade-off between it. We would, I know I wanted to kind of push it a little bit more, but um, there, were, there, were, there were points in time where we just had to make that compromise. And that worked well. So, so you know, we have to find the balance right, I think. Amelia, did you want to comment on that as well? Well, just on the on the work thing, it, it's an extra thing. Neve and Lucina already have demanding jobs. In fact, three jobs each already. And so uh, it, it does take, it's very time consuming. And um, that just, just that that goes both ways, that um, you've got to find people prepared to, with the patience and the commitment to put the time in. So you'd have to have a project that's really uh, committed to that and all the people involved committed to that. And um, it's, um, it's involved, isn't it? It's an involved process. You know, Lucina didn't do it last time and you, you can't really describe to somebody what it's going to be like. You know, you can't say, well, you can say, look, you're going to think everything's okay on a Friday night and then you're going to get a massive email from me or somebody saying, you know, that thing you explained, I still don't get it or, or they'll get a script. And even with the best will in the world, we've put something in, but it hasn't landed right. And so it begins this conversation. So a question back to maybe Neve and Lucina then about, about that process. Was there anything that you kind of learned about what, what you do or, or yourself in going through these conversations and, and working through the, the content for, for Traces? Yep, go for it, Lucina. Thank you. Um, I think it's, it's, it's one of those things. So, uh, yes, one of my jobs is to explain what I do and to uh, communicate that to people who are learning, who have got um, some background in science, potentially. Um, so, so that part of it, so that, that, that explanation, or when I go and I work with, whether it's working with the police or whether it's working with um, uh, solicitors or whoever I work with, I am, or I'm in court, I'm communicating what I do and I'm communicating it to lay people. So that part of it is, is yes, that's our job. It's part of our job as academics. It's part of our job as forensic scientists. But what it is and, and has brought home to me is to, to all those things that you do without thinking because you've been doing it for a long time or, or a while. So you don't, those small steps that are just automatic. So breaking things down to those very small steps can be really challenging because I'm three steps ahead because yes, I do that without thinking about it because it's just what I do. Um, so the actual forensic anthropology, yes, I know I have to explain that, but those steps of even, you know, how, how you would communicate with people, how you would um, uh, walk onto a scene, where you would have to sign in, all of that sort of thing, those small things that you don't think twice about doing. I've had to remember that I do them. And that has been challenging at times, is just remembering those small, small things. Dave, is there anything you wanted to add as well? And I, I, I would, I would absolutely endorse that. And I think for for me, it was um, looking at 
just again it's the small things not so much stepping out on, onto scenes but looking at you know how do we set up the the instrumentation how do we go about taking a sample from the bag into the mortar and pestle to grind it up taking a subsample from that and putting it into a vial to put a liquid in it to dissolve it taking that and putting it into the machine and, and doing that which we would just do automatically because that's just the sample preparation you do it um uh, just routinely when you're analyzing um uh, substances such as as drugs how you set up the sequence on the machine all of that bits bits of it and how you just know that the machine you know you check to make sure that it's going to work and it becomes just that automatic um set of things and it was all of that and and you know the, the media in particular would 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 listen very patiently i think to us telling that story and then would ask us to go back to the first step and just check that the that the learning and the understanding of it was correct and i think it it, it was that it was really breaking down and it's it's a very interesting experience as a scientist working with a really talented writer because it's really breaking it down into the exact um, minutiae of the steps because from Amelia's view she's looking at and thinking about what is it going to look like on the screen and how is it that you're going to bring a viewer through that process so that they also get the automatic nature of of that but for us it's a very simple set of tasks but it's not the bit that's exciting, which is getting the results and doing something with them. It's just simply the step-by-step -step process that is ingrained in you as an analytical chemist in this, in this, um, in that regard. So it was really breaking and really thinking about what science communication actually means when you're actually trying to engage people in taking them on that journey with you. So it was really insightful, as I hadn't, uh, you know, as Lucina said, I hadn't just hadn't broken it down into those little bits and steps. Um, quite so 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 well before. Thanks, Steve. Um, I've got a question over to Laura and Jen. So I think it was Laura, you mentioned you were excited um, about the script. So is there anything particularly about um, Traces, the script, that really attracted you to the, to the show? For the, the second series or for the first or? Both. Oh, both. <laughs> um, well, I just thought this really detailed forensic backdrop, like, you know, that you've got all the emotional stuff going on as well. But then, you know, I, I hadn't, I've, I'd never done anything like that. I hadn't seen it in this specific way before. I found it really interesting and I loved it. It was these two women um, and I love Kathy and Sarah. Um, and I, I I, th I think I thought I, I, I might learn a bit as well. And I, um, but then after watching, I mean, it's not that um, it's written brilliantly. It's, and it's not that I don't understand what I'm saying. I, I understand the, the actual words I'm saying. It's just the, the, the bigger picture that I wish. I mean, I'm kind of interested in, in a way, watching the show. I understood it a wee bit more. Um, but I just, I'm just interested in it. Um, and I'm interested in these real women as well, and um, they're here tonight. And um, uh, yeah, I'll let you talk, Jen. No, I, I totally agree, Laura. It's like uh, you know, I mentioned before. Just when I first read the script, I was I was just really drawn into all the characters, not just um, the one I was auditioning for, but but everyone was just. Uh, so multi-dimensional and uh, interesting and just finding out their different sort of um, backgrounds and and what their thing is, you know? And uh, yeah, I just, I really love, of course, that it, you know, that there are these female leads and um, that it was a, a variety of ages and uh, that yes, that they're open to, to diversity in the cast because you could be from anywhere to do this job and it is a world renowned university and it doesn't really matter, you know, so it was just uh, uh, To me, it was firing on all cylinders. So I was just like, oh my God, this is yes. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> you know? Thanks, Bo. Um, so we've got another question in. I think we might only have chance for maybe one or two questions left. This one was to uh, Neve and Lucina. Is it easier explaining to writers and producers 
producers and to judges and lawyers or public inquiries? That's quite a tough question, but I'm going to put it to you. So that's over to you, Neve and Lucina. You go first, Lucina, go on. <laughs> it's scarier to explain it to judges and in court um, uh, than it is to explain it to Amelia, who's very, very, very... Um, patient with our explanations and ask questions it's a completely it's it's different so when you when you're you're um, explaining it in a um it, to amelia then i you can you can expand you can elaborate she can ask as many questions as she wants and does ask very many questions which is really good because it really um puts you on the spot but so there's many parallels um when you're Doing it in a live situation, you have to be very aware um, of, of what you're saying, and it is very um, constrained by the parameters of whatever situation you're working in. So you can't go off on a flight of fancy. You can't um, sort of think, oh, what about this and what about that? You have to really be concentrating really hard because um, every piece of information you give has to be accurate and as accurate as possible, but you also have to make sure that you communicate um, any uncertainties, any areas where there may be, you know, you cannot say this um, 100%, you know, that, that this may or may not, or it could mean this or it could mean that, you have to be very clear. So it has different consequences, and I think those different consequences um, uh, change that communication. You're still communicating the same, same way, you're still communicating and breaking something down to a lay person, um, but one has much more serious consequences, whereas, um, yes, I don't want to be um, getting anything wrong for Amelia, but I can actually um, go back to it and, and have that other conversation and keep that conversation going in a slightly different way. So I've got, um, it's like more relaxed, I think, um, would be the way to put it. Um, I, I would only add, I would endorse that absolutely, and I would only add that when, when you're, you're explaining things as part of evidence in a case, the situation that you're doing it in is much, much more formal. So it's within, you're standing in a witness box and you're answering the, only the questions that, uh, that essentially you've been asked. So it's a very different set of circumstances and that creates a different sort of um, um, requirement almost in, in some of the circumstances of what you're trying to say and what you're trying to explain. You still have, have in essence, the same outcome which is you're trying to explain what your finding in a case means um, to the triers of fact, which is the jury, which means the public. And you're trying to explain what you found in your examinations or in the work that you did within and what it means, the value of it within the context of a framework of circumstances, which is the allegation that, that's, um, that the case relates to. Um, so so you're, you're still trying to communicate a scientific message to the best of your ability so that the people who have to make a difficult decision are able to make that decision. But yeah, it's a, it's a very different context. Thanks, Paul. So we're coming, oh, sorry, Val, yep. I just want to say one thing here that uh, I, I feel immensely lucky here. I had my wee idea um, and, and I, I wrote it down on a few sheets of paper and I talked to various people uh, and then I ended up with a dream team. I mean, it, it, I've been so lucky with Amelia as a writer, I've been so lucky with our scientific advisors, with the production team, but particularly with our cast. We have done exactly what Amelia was talking about earlier, they inhabit the characters so that when they think of a better line than, than we could have come up with in a hundred years, it's there because they just, they feel it. And so I think we were stupendously lucky to pull all that together for the first series. And I can't believe we get to do it all over again to delight people again. Uh, and, and for me, that's, that's the, the end product is we make people happy, but we also educate them and make them think along the way. Thanks, Val. So I think we're going to just about come to the end of this session. I do want to... Um, mentioned that there's a few few things going on at the minute. This uh, taking place in Dundee is a Dundee uh, Women's Festival that's taking place at the minute. So you can see more events that are going on there as part of that programme. I want to thank everyone for taking the time to be with us tonight as part of this webinar. This is our first big live stream event. So I think it's all gone 
or key. If anyone does have any feedback they'd like to share with us, please get in touch with us at LRCFS. And also, we have lots of research taking place at LRCFS as well that people can get involved in. So please um, take a look at our website and our links and maybe get involved with some of the work that's going on there as well. But before we finish, I think we need to talk a little bit about Series 2. So is there any news? Do we know when we might see Series 2 of Traces and where we might see it? Amelia, I think you've unmuted, ready to go. I think I've got a, uh, I've heard it goes out in October. That's obviously subject to all kinds of things, but um, that's on a terrifying piece of paper. I keep the other side of this room, so it's not too close to my desk. And I believe it, it has to go out on Alibi first because they make it, UK TV commissioned it. But because BBC One bought series one, part of that deal was they bought one and the future of two. So it will go out on Alibi initially, autumn this year, I believe. And then at some point in the future, it'll be on the BBC, BBC One. Well, thank you all so, so much for um, giving up some time this evening. As we've established, everyone is very busy who is part of um, the Traces team. So thank you very much for participating. And thanks to all the um, lovely comments that have been coming in as well on the Q&A, as well as the questions. Um, so I think that is all from us this evening and um, hopefully we'll connect with you via um, social media channels and also um, you'll see some of the faces here on screen later in the autumn. And can I, can I just say thank you Heather for hosting, fantastic, for Pauline, the genius behind um, the cameras to make sure that we were all able to do this. Really appreciate both of you and all of your hard work. And ladies, an absolute pleasure as always. Thank you so, so much for taking part in, in this uh, webinar uh, for us and for the Centre on International Women's Day. What could be better? Thank you. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thank you, guys.